Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AIHM Wellness Webinar Series. We are really excited to have our gold sponsor, Emerson Ecologics and Wellevate, with us today for a great presentation on enhancing heart health. As folks are joining us via Zoom, I want to welcome anyone who is here for the first time, as well as those of you who are returning to join us today. Next slide. I want to tell you a little bit about the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, or AIHM. We are a global interprofessional integrative health association working to transform healthcare through body, mind, spirit, community, and planet. And as you can see on this slide, we have a very rich history of former organizations that have been around since the 70s and the 90s that merged and formed AIHM. Next slide. For those of you who are interested in a more in-depth educational fellowship, it's a two-year program. It's 1,000 hours of evidence-based curriculum. It's for licensed clinicians with a master's degree or higher. It's a wonderful program. This is a, a photo of our first cohort and our fellowship director, Dr. Erica Capaluti, is there in the center in the white shirt. If you wanna find out more about it, I'm gonna mention it in two more slides at the end of today's webinar. If you're interested in learning more, reach out to me. My name is April. I'm the Director of Admissions, and we're joined by my rock star colleague, Andrea, who's running the slides for us today. If you apply to the fellowship and you mention this webinar, you get $1,500 off tuition. Okay. It is my pleasure to introduce today's host, Dr. Eric Nelson. Dr. Nelson practices general naturopathic medicine with an emphasis on naturopathic sports medicine, nutrition, and diet counseling, nutritional ergogenic aids, and botanical medicine. In 2018, he was appointed to New Hampshire by New Hampshire's governor to the New Hampshire Naturopathic Board of Examiners. Dr. Nelson has published and co-authored numerous peer-reviewed articles and case studies in a variety of topics, including sports medicine, botanical medicine, dermatology, and infectious disease. Dr. Nelson is going to be joined, as, as we are as well, by special guests, Dr. Stephen Sinatra and Dr. Robert Sheeler. Dr. Nelson will give a little bit about their bio in a minute. Okay, just give us a second until we get the technological kink worked out. It's Zoom on a Friday. Do you need me to see if I can play it? I got it. Oh. I'm Dr. Eric Nelson. I'm a naturopathic doctor and a member of your Emerson Ecologics medical education team. Uh, really excited to be hosting our panel discussion today. We've got some amazing experts with us. Uh, I'll give you a quick bio to introduce you to both of them. Dr. Bob Sheeler is the board chair of the Emerson Ecologics Medical Advisory Board. He's one of the leading functional medicine experts in the country. Spent over 20 years at the Mayo Clinic, both as a department chair and as an associate professor. And we're really glad to have him with us today. Welcome, Dr. Sheeler. Thank you. Happy to be here. 
I'm also very pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen Sinatra. Dr. Sinatra is a world-renowned expert in integrative cardiology. He's published over a dozen books in integrative medicine and is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and has served in the past as Chief of Cardiology for Manchester Memorial Hospital in Connecticut. Welcome, Dr. Sinatra. Well, thanks so much, Eric. All right. Well, let's get right into it. Um, a little background on our topic today. We're talking about cardiovascular and cardiometabolic health. Um, overall, it's a very timely topic because cardiovascular disease, whether it's hypertension, dyslipidemia, heart attacks, and stroke, there are huge problems in the country right now. Um, heart disease remains the leading cause of death in the United States. Furthermore, cardiometabolic disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, both in the adult and pediatric populations are at all time highs. Um, it makes sense providers and patients turn to supplements to help fill in the gaps for heart health support. So my hope is today we can help share some additional insight into specific ingredients with our providers joining us. Um, without further ado, first off, as a functional medicine expert, um, and an integrative cardiologist, what role do you see supplements playing in supporting cardiovascular and cardiometabolic health? Um, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Sheeler first. Well, I look at supplements as really not distinct from pharmacologic drugs. And when I was at Mayo, I bought over a billion dollars of, of medicines. They were mostly neurologic and psychiatric. But in the process, I came up with kind of an algorithm that looks at safety, effectiveness, cost effectiveness, availability, and reimbursement. And so I put all those in the hopper whenever I'm looking at something, whether it's a device or a supplement or an RX pharmaceutical. And honestly, I'm kind of agnostic as to who owns it. I just want to know if it's going to affect the pathways I want and if it's the safest or most highest impact thing. So sometimes people say, oh, I want all natural medicines. I go, okay, but there's an RX pharmaceutical that's really precisely targeted to what you're trying to do. Or they'll say, I'm only going to take medicines my insurance pays for. I say, Okay, but they have a lot of side effects and there are natural ways to do that that are going to be better for you. So honestly, I use lots of supplements for my patients, but I still use a fair number of pharmacologic drugs too. I use whatever fits best for the patient. Any thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Sinatra, as well? Yeah, I agree with Dr. Sheeler. I mean, what, what, whatever works for the patient is really the smart medicine approach. Uh, but when it comes to cardiovascular health, um, I like a lot of supplements uh, for congestive heart failure support. I mean, uh, that's how I developed my program in metabolic cardiology, uh, where I, tr I, I tend to use targeted nutritional supplements like CoQ10, D-ribose, magnesium, and L-carnitine to drive ATP in a preferential direction. Because um, the heart's all about ATP and the heart's all about energy. And a, and a, a heart and heart failure is an energy starved heart. And what we need to do is really in, infuse the myocytes or the cardiac cells with energy. So heart failure is, is really one of my prime concerns, uh, you know, using targeted nutritional supports. The other thing I really uh, focus on is, is plaque stabilization. In other words, you want to avoid plaque rupture. And uh, there's certain nutraceuticals uh, that you can use that will avoid or, or actually help to prevent uh, plaque rupture. Uh, and then the last thing is, is high blood pressure. I mean, there is absolutely an epidemic of high blood pressure in the United States today. You know, whether that's due to, uh, you know, lifestyle factors, uh, certainly a lot of emotional stress as a result of COVID, uh, you know, being indoors, feeling trapped. Uh, a lot of it can be related to, uh, you know, 5G situations, uh, you know, uh, Wi-Fi, things like that, where, where these insidious waves tend to penetrate the body. And, you know, people can get anything from atrial fibrillation to hypertension to cardiac arrhythmias. So I, I think the world is becoming more and more. And uh, this is where, Eric, you know, people in your profession, uh, you know, really need to be acknowledged because I think detoxification is, is really going to be the uh, management uh, for most of us in the future going forward. Well, I appreciate that. Um... When we're talking about specific supplement ingredients, um, if you both had to pick your top five supplements for overall heart health, what would they be? Um, we'll start with uh, Dr. Sinatra this time. If you had to just pick five uh, for overall heart health, what would they be? Well, I like to pick almost six, but I'll, I'll give you I'll give you five, and then I'll give you the, the actually the, the 
my sixth combination is at the end of the talk. It's the nanokinase, lumbrokinase. I love those two, and I've used them for years in my practice. Uh, but certainly CoQ10 is at the top of the list. Uh, D-ribose, magnesium, uh, omega-3s. I mean, if, if I was stranded on a desert island, I would like to have some Q10 omega-3. And vitamin K2. I mean, when it comes to plaques, you know, the development of plaque, um, I'll never forget, I was at a lecture at Yale New Haven Hospital about 18, 15 years ago when uh, Dr. Cees Vermeer and Leanne Schragers were talking. These were two Dutchmen uh, who actually did the research on vitamin K2. And I got to tell you, uh, Dr. Sheeler and Eric, when, when I was sitting in the audience, I was on fire listening to this because, you know, when you think you can use a supplement to take calcium out of blood vessels where it doesn't belong and transfer it to bones where it does belong, that this metaquinone seven story uh, had an incredible, you know, sizzle to it. And I, and I was so attracted to it. I ended up taking these researchers out to dinner on two occasions because <laughs> I wanted to tap their brains on vitamin K2. And, and, and I think, you know, in the, in the world of coronary artery disease, this is one must nutraceutical that we need to use going forward. Awesome. Uh, same question, Dr. Sheeler. Well, I agree with a lot of those, but I'm going to give some slightly different ones just so that people get something else. So I'm huge on magnesium. So um, you can look at counties where there's wet counties and dry counties in Texas and other places like that. In the wet counties, they have less heart attacks, but they, with the alcohol, they have a lot more heart rhythm problems like atrial fibrillation. And I think mitral and I think magnesium is a really good way to offset that risk to some degree. It helps the brain a lot too. And I do a lot of brain related work, but I love magnesium for both the heart and the brain. I had natokinase at the top of my list and I often give it with pycnogenol. So I'm going to sneak a sixth one in there as well, because I really like that combination for anti-inflammatory and anti-clotting. Um, I use garlic sometimes and I actually like it in the diet. One time I went on the binge of eating six cloves of garlic a day. And first my wife made me keep it out in the refrigerator oh. in the garage. And then finally I figured out she was just kissing me to be nice. So I switched over to some of the other garlic extracts that are better. I am a huge fan of olive polyphenols because I think they're sort of a distilled essence of the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet without extra virgin olive oil doesn't do, do nearly as well as with it. And there are provinces or whatever they are, have in Italy where they use nothing but EVOO for cooking and smoothies and salads and everything. And their cardiovascular risk is dramatically lower. The other thing I really like is tocotrienols. And so tocotrienols will actually affect HMG-CoA reductase in a gentler way than statins. They don't maybe have all the plaque stabilization, but they have a breadth of activity, especially the delta fraction. Awesome. If we shift gears now a little bit to the lab side, um, on Wellave Labs, we have a number of excellent integrative cardiovascular labs. Uh, what would you say are some labs that you feel are really important for assessing cardiovascular health? Um, I'll turn to you, Dr. Sinatra, first as the uh, cardiologist. Well, um, you know, Dr. Sheila came from the Cleveland Clinic. So, I mean, the Cleveland Heart Lab, I think it's, a, you, know, you know, an awesome place to start. I mean, I think they have some really good diagnostic testing, uh, especially, you know, on inflammatory mediators. Um, you can't go wrong if you order your cardiovascular tests from them. Um, I, I think Quest Diagnostics uh, still does a good job. Uh, where I practice cardiology in New England, we use Quest on a regular basis. And they had to, uh, I used to test CoQ10 levels in my patients uh, all the time. And I used to send them to Quest. Quest used to send them out. And uh, I, was, I was well satisfied with Quest. Um, and, and again, I, um, you know, any laboratory is good if they give you reliable data. I mean, that's the way I, I look at it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they, you know, including the, the, the local hospitals that, that can, you know. Any specific tests, sorry to cut you off, Dr. Sheeler, any, uh, or, or Dr. Sinatra, any specific tests that you like uh, for integrative uh, studies? You mean for, um, for assessing cardiovascular risk? Yeah, such as like fractionated lipoproteins or um, omega three quantification. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, there, there's a lot of tests. I mean, um, you could go crazy, but you know, with inflammatory mediators. I mean, C reactive protein, ferritin, homocysteine. I mean, uh, fibrinogen. I mean, the list goes on and on. But I think, as a cardiologist, um, and I've looked at this for decades, uh, I think LP little a. Uh, is really the most important cardiovascular risk factor going forward. Um, it's, it, it's not cholesterol. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the great cholesterol myth. I mean, 
I, I've personally done over 3,000 cardiac catheterizations. I mean, I've tested people with high cholesterols, low cholesterols. Um, I was involved in that Framingham data where, where actually a lot of the doctors became psychotic because people were living the longest with higher cholesterols over decades. But when it comes to LP little a, that's the one risk factor that I was fearful of. And, uh, re, uh, you know, reducing LP little a or neutralizing LP little a is really key. And that's how I got attracted to lumbrokinase and nanokinase because, you know, a lot of people couldn't tolerate niacin. Uh, mm -hmm. But they could tolerate, you know, lumbro and, and natto. And even though it, it may not change the LP little a number, it does uh, uh, decrease, you know, the hypercoagulability and the, and the inflammatory components of LP little a. So when it comes to a risk factor analysis uh, in heart disease, I'll put little LP little a at the top of the list. Dr. Sheeler, any other um, integrative lab studies and tests in particular that you really like? Um, for your patients? Sure. I use regular labs to give me um, an assessment of inflammation and risk as well, but I also will echo the LP little a. We run genetics on about 70% of our patients, and 10 to 20% of people have bad LPA genetics. And so um, you're right, it's hard to influence it itself unless you've already had a heart attack and somebody wants to pay for a CETP inhibitor. But in general, you can offset some of those risks by protecting the endothelium and by decreasing some of the clotting risk. Um, so uh, I like a general CBC. If your white count is under 6,800, that's one good inflammation marker that's good. I, of course, use HSCRP and a Reynolds risk calculator because there's a lot of data there. We do fractionated NMR lipids, like I'm sure a lot of the other cardiologists and, and I imagine Dr. Sinatra does as well, because if you have lots of little, little L LDL particles, that's like bullets that penetrate your arteries. If you have the big ones, they're more like beach balls that kind of bounce off the side. And so you want to know particle size and especially um, LD, small LDL particles. I like ApoB and that seems to correlate pretty well. I do check coenzyme Q10 some of the time and iron studies. And it's especially interesting to look at the difference between iron iron binding and ferritin. So ferritin's up, but iron iron binding is not that's an inflammatory process, usually um, with an axis of the liver. And that indicates to me that there's probably insulin resistance and other things like that developing. So those would be some of my favorites. I also usually like to run an ApoE4 because I don't want to just keep your heart going. I'd like to have your brain working at the same time. Sounds yeah, that, great. That was well said, Dr. Sheeler. I, 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 I liked what you said, and I would echo all your comments. Uh, Eric, I would add one more thing. that I There's one more test that I really like. Sure. Uh, I like the triglyceride to HDL ratio. Um, I felt that that was a really almost like a knockout punch. In other words, if your triglyceride to HDL ratio was less than two, uh, or like 1.5 to two, uh, that was a great marker that you will probably not get heart disease. I mean, uh, I saw that over and over again over decades because I, I used to test that marker. Uh, consistently, even in my early 30s when I became board certified in cardiology. So it's a problem with a lot of diabetics is that they have high triglycerides and low HDL. And when you get a ratio over five, I get a little bit worried, but frequently I would see them over 10. And that's a real inflammatory situation. Uh, and, you know, many times I would try the lower triglycerides while increasing HDL at the same time. You know, using diet, less sugars, for example, and targeting nutraceuticals as well. Great. That's that's great insight. Um, shifting gears now a little bit, um, on the cardiometabolic lab testing side of things, Dr. Sheeler, you came up with a really informative algorithm regarding blood glucose lab testing and supplementation strategies. Would you be able to uh, walk us through that a little bit for of us course. today? Sure. So my belief is, is that glucotoxicity, insulin resistance, and the whole pathway to metabolic syndrome is a lot of cardiovascular risk. And like Dr. Sinatra said, is cholesterol by itself without inflammation, without all these other factors, is not necessarily um, a problem. And I kind of go with the patient's family history. If they have a cholesterol of 300 and everybody in their family lived to 110, then I'm probably a little less concerned about that if their inflammatory markers are low and they've got no plaque in their arteries and their CT coronary score is zero, then I am somebody who has good numbers, but maybe on high LPA and, and other things like that. But I really think glucose has been neglected and it's probably, we were sort of led away from it by industry studies years ago that sort of put 
put the finger on fats when the finger really should have been on glucose all along and now it's coming out of the shadows. And um, there are countries around the world who have eaten diets for years that are less than 40 to 50 grams of, of sugar a day. And they have much less problems than, than we do in terms of the whole metabolic syndrome, hypertension, coronary disease, stroke type stuff. So I like to look um, at a number of things. And so this is just a straightforward algorithm that I designed for people to start with. So lots of folks are new to functional and integrative medicine. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what some of these things represent. So by using just a fasting sugar, and a glycohemoglobin that you can get from Wellevate Labs, we can look and see, is the glycohemoglobin high or normal? And then see what the fasting sugar does, because the glycohemoglobin represents the area under the curve for all, all night long, but especially all day long. How high does your sugar go when you eat? And then how long does it take for your insulin and your muscle and other things to kind of get that down to normal? So on the left side of the curve, if your left side of the graph, if your A1C is high and then your fasting sugar is high, then your overnight problem is that your basal insulin secretion is not um, enough um, to make up for your fasting gluconeogenesis. If on the other hand, your fasting sugar is normal, but your A1C is high, that means that when you eat, your sugar goes up too high and stays up too high and goes down and then goes down after that. And one of the things I really love to do with my patients is get them to do a continuous glucose monitor so they can say, well, I ate a mango and my sugar went to 200 and I ate a Krispy Kreme and it only went to 110. Now there's a whole bunch of other reasons not to eat a Krispy Kreme, but you really ought to know about the mango because people's responses are individual. So if you have a high A1C and a high fasting sugar, then I like berberine a lot. Berberine is good for lipids to some degree and it's very good for sugar. It's as, probably as good as metformin for some people. I like bitter melon and cinnamon. So cinnamon is good for insulin resistance and bitter melon is good to protect your islet cells. And so there's some data that shows that it works by several mechanisms, but the reason that I like it the best is it's extremely well tolerated and I really wanna save my islet cells if I'm going forward. So I use that sort of double whammy if I've got the high A1C and the high um, fasting sugar. If on the other hand, I just have a high A1C and a normal fasting sugar, then I'd use the berberine, which just hammers the sugar down and I'd also use the cinnamon for the insulin resistance. If we look at the other side of the equation where the A1C is normal, so your average day and night is pretty good, but your fasting sugar is high, then I'm more concerned about preserving your islet cells over time. And then the last one is if your A1C is normal and your fasting sugar is normal, but you have a reason to try to protect your glucose metabolism, like you had gestational diabetes and it went away. You previously had prediabetes, you lost some weight and it got better. You have a high visceral adipose with a high BMI, fatty liver or statin use. And I don't think we pay enough attention to that because I've seen data presented by cardiologists, exercise physiologists I work with, and they showed their wonderful program and they put everybody on statins and their sugar started out at 95 and ended up at 128. And so, even though they had everything else well controlled, I think full dose statins sometimes tend to tend to push things that way, except maybe pativastatin. So for folks who are just normal and trying to protect that, I like to do bitter melon, but I also like to do CoQ10. And like Dr. Sinatra, I like to use ubiquinol, um, uh, ubiquinol as well. Great. Thank you for that insight, Dr. Sheeler. I also have some information here that you put uh, in regarding follow-up. Right, so after we do that, the nice thing about it is you can see a pretty quick response between both fasting sugar and A1C. If you really get on the program, you start walking, you start exercising. And from my Tai Chi training in China, one of the things I learned is the person who walks a thousand steps after every meal will live to be 99. And then about two years after I learned that, there was a study that came out that showed that people who walked after every meal actually had lower glycohemoglobin. So even just moving and walking is helpful. Low glycemic diet, we talked about trying to get to less than 40 or 50 grams a day. And so you have to know there's one gram of sugar in a, in a handful of almonds. And there's, you know, you can look at some yogurts will have four grams of sugar in them and some will have 40. And some of the lattes you get at the fancy coffee places will have 70 or 80. And so you take that, that's two days worth of sugar. 
And so I think if we try to get people on the dietary program, we get them moving and we help teach them to learn about sugar intake, um, we'll get good results with that alone. And then we add those specific supplements in and often they see the kind of response that motivates them to go further and invest in their health rather than, well, this is just one more thing I can't control. And that's why I chose to develop this algorithm is I want doctors who are new to this to have a way to say, let's address this for these people so that they get an early success and both the doctor and the patient get more engaged in trying to fix the risk factors rather than waiting until it's at the stage of disease. Great. Thank you for that insight. Um, switching gears now to the subject of supplement ingredients, um, I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts on the recent uh, health claim by the FDA regarding magnesium. I'll read it here for us. Um, supportive but inconclusive scientific evidence suggests that diets with adequate amounts of magnesium may reduce the risk of high blood pressure, a condition associated with many factors. Um, how do you gentlemen use magnesium in your cardiovascular patients and what are the doses you aim for or forms that you use more often? You, you want me to go first, Eric? Or? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, yeah, magnesium is part of my awesome foursome. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I use it practically in every one of my cardiovascular patients because unlike what this slide suggests, um, and I'm sure Dr. Sheila will agree, I mean, there's profound magnesium deficiencies in the population. The problem is, is that most docs, uh, especially conventional medical docs, they test for a serum um, uh, magnesium. When you really have to test the RBC magnesium, because many times the serum magnesium would be low, I mean, I mean, be normal, but the RBC magnesium will be low. And, uh, and, uh, you know, when I started to test RBC magnesiums, I was really shocked about how many profound magnesium deficiencies were in the population. So I'm a big believer in magnesium. Now, as far as different types of magnesium, um, uh, I'll never forget it. I was at a CoQ10 conference in Italy about, oh, about 15, 20 years ago. And it was an Australian uh, uh, vascular, cardiovascular surgeon who was talking about CoQ10. And he was talking about heart and lung bypass and about, you know, you know, things I'm, I'm very privy to, you know, because we had a lot of patients getting bypass surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And he introduced the crowd to magnesium orotate. And um, when I came out of that conference, I, I actually came back to Healthy Directions and I asked them to, we, we must find the magnesium orotate. And the reason being is that, you know, any Krebs cycle magnesium, I, 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 you know, I, I like, I mean, I, there, there's so many of them. But magnesium orotate drives ATP. In other words, this, this helps even drive ATP even more. And because I, I just feel like, you know, as a heart specialist, I, I believe in the whole mechanism of ATP and energy support, that it made sense to me to go with magnesium orotate. So when it comes to different forms of magnesium, I like Krebs cycle components. And again, uh, I combine it with magnesium orotate as well. Great. Any additional thoughts, Dr. Sheeler? Well, I think that that equivocal statement is like wild enthusiasm if you're in a government position. And so that's about as far as they could go. And so I interpret that as as positive. So I try to stay under 450 milligrams a day for most people, especially if I'm worried about their renal function or they're older. But um, I'm interested to learn about magnesium orotate. I've not used that. I use a lot of magnesium malate and bisglycinate just because they're well tolerated. And for people who have constipation type stuff, then I use some of the other types of magnesiums like citrate that tend to move things forward because that's a, an issue for people. And then for any brain stuff, I like to use the magnesium three and eight because it crosses the blood brain barrier better. Awesome. Uh, obviously, magnesium happens to be an important mineral electrolyte um, that can also be depleted quite often by a number of cardiovascular, cardiometabolic pharmaceuticals. Um, I'm going to put up a table here, but uh, could both of you share some of your experiences you have with uh, the clinical importance of supplementation to address uh, drug-induced nutrient depletions, in particular with uh, cardiovascular pharmaceuticals? Yeah, I mean, uh, perhaps I should go first on this because uh, um, I used to lecture for the drug companies on, on statins years ago until I read this article that came out of the uh, literature from Asia, actually out of India, uh, which demonstrated that uh, statins uh, shared the same uh, pathway, the malabinate pathway where CoQ10 is produced. And as a CoQ10 user, I, I immediately had to stop lecturing for the, 
drug companies because I said, oh my gosh, I, I, I found a, an incredible downside of statins. So, you know, statins really deplete CoQ10. And any person, uh, and look, I'm not going to throw statins under the bus. I happen to believe in a very low dose statin, especially if you chase it with a lot of CoQ10 at the same time. I mean, I use very low doses of statins, particularly in young men with coronary disease, not, not in older men, of, you know, men my age or older, or in, or in women. I, I, I have not been impressed with the use of statins in women, too many side effects. But in young men, you know, men, you know, less than 75 years old, I'll use a low dose statin with uh, certainly at least a, 100 to 200 milligrams of a, of a good quality CoQ10. Now, beta blockers are, are the same. They can, they can affect the CoQ10 levels. Uh, oh, you have it on. A, you have a slide on this. this I do. Yep. Yeah. You know, yep. Yeah. You, know uh, uh, you know, thiazide diuretics, notorious for magnesium and potassium. I mean, oh my God, the potassium depletion. And uh, as a young cardiologist, uh, I used to use a lot of thiazides, uh, very low dose thiazides, and I saw profound, and I mean profound potassium, uh, uh, you know, diminutions of my patients. And uh, unfortunately, I was very young then, and uh, I didn't uh, question a lot of pharmaceuticals like I should have. And uh, my patients, and I'm sure Dr. Sheila can tell you this, your patients are your best teachers. And, uh, you know, the, the potassium depletion with thiazides were, were enormous. I do like potassium sparing diuretics, uh, especially uh, uh, when I'm treating, uh, you know, borderline congestive heart failure. I, I, I do like these, uh, you know, the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. Uh, certainly, they they can deplete uh, uh, CoQ10. I've seen that many, many times. Uh, metformin, you know, I will say this. Uh, I was part of the anti-aging movement at the A4M for years. And uh, I, like many of the doctors, were, were taking metformin. I mean, I mean for over a decade. Uh, but Dr. Sheeler is right. I mean, berberine is, is really, I, I think, uh, uh, even better than metformin. So I switched to berberine years ago myself. So, you know... Uh, a lot of these drugs that we used in the past, we use in less of today uh, because they do have nutrient depletions. And, it, and uh, it's just very, very important for both the naturopathic physician as well as the, you know, you know, the orthodox medical physician to realize that these drugs do come with a lot of, you know, uh, downside. And the downside is, uh, you know, lower nutrient depletions, which can, can have a profound effect on people's quality of life. For sure. Dr. Sheeler, anything else to add about uh, drug-induced nutrient depletions? No, I think this, I use this mostly as a motivation to get people to take the things I wanted them to take anyway. And so I've generally tried to get people to take multivitamin, multiminerals. Um, zinc is a little tricky. Most of the time, I don't like to supplement with extra copper because copper is neurotoxic. But if you don't have enough of it, you have immune and bone problems and you get an anemia. So I measure those sometimes. And other times, if a person eats a lot of nuts, and so especially things like walnuts are very healthy for you. Um, so walnuts are, uh, almost all nuts are a good source of copper. And then um, Brazil nuts are a good source of selenium. So if you're trying to get that naturally, that's another way to do it. Um, but a good multivitamin, multimineral supplement is generally essential, especially if you're trying to offset some of the pharmaceutical losses. Great, thank you. All right, so now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and um, go through some of the unique supplement ingredient research that's been published and wondering your take on the body of research that's out there, if you have any clinical insights to some of these ingredients. Um, it makes sense some of these ingredients are, are botanical derived. Um, I'm not gonna age anyone here, but some of the older cardiology drugs were often plant derived, things like digitalis, uh, reserpine from Rawolfia, atropine from belladonna. Um, and first on our list, I think, is going to be hibiscus sabdurifa, which uh, most people, when they think of hibiscus, they think of those giant uh, tropical flowers on Hawaiian shirts. Um, hibiscus sabdurifa is a little bit different. It's known as uh, Florida Jamaica. It's an, an important botanical species to uh, Mexican, Central American, and Caribbean culture. It's a really interesting drink if you've ever had it because it's got this rich um, red pigment to it and it's it's full of antioxidants and anthocyanins that give it the red color. Um, it comes in either like a powder or, or tea or it can also be in, encapsulated. Um, it tastes something along the lines of cranberry or raspberry and uh, is often sweetened with sugar or honey and cinnamon. 
And uh, you can also use like stevia or monk fruit extract in it as well. But a couple of the research articles that I shared with you have come up with some interesting findings in regards to some of the anthocyanin pigments in there and possible ACE inhibitor activity that's been uh, associated with it. I'm wondering your thoughts on some of that research or if you guys can provide any additional insight into uh, hibiscus for us. I'll defer to you, Dr. I was going to defer to you as well. So I've used I've used this some, but I'm, I'm not really aggressive with it. It's not in my kind of top 10 things. And I'm always interested to learn as part of my functional medicine training and studying herbal things, you know, which which medicines have different properties. And so it's interesting to note that it has, you know, effects on the renin-angiotensin system. But then I also worry, you know, okay, it's got those effects, but does it have some of the same side effects? Do we need to worry about renal function in people with renal artery stenosis? Do we need to worry about angioedema type effects? And so I, I think all these things are a two-edged sword. So when I read people putting out ads that say, and this product has no side effects whatsoever, it's like, there's nothing that has no side effects. Water has side effects if you take too much of it. And so um, this looks to me like it could be a kinder, gentler um, pathway for the um, renin-angiotensin system, and I would just like to see larger studies done um, with standardized preparations to know sort of the dose effects as well as to follow um, the side effects and see if they follow the renin follow the inhibition of the renin-angiotensin system as well. Awesome. Well, great insight there. And uh, next, we're going to talk about Crotagus. Crotagus, obviously, Hawthorne, very interesting and long historical use in traditional herbalism. Um, there's been some unique uh, botanical perspectives on it. Um, it's an interesting species in terms of uh, just botanical and genetics um, because there's so many different uh, species of, of Crotagus and Hawthorne out there in a small geographical area. You can have dozens of different species with multiple uh, phenotypes and there's so much genetic variability within the, uh, the genus of Crotagus. Um, when we talk about Crotagus being used as a supplement or as an ingredient in a supplement, typically it's the berries that are used. The, the research typically suggests the bioflavonoids and the proanthocyanins or the pigments in these berries are what have the active effect. Um, there's been a couple studies on Crotagus. Um, wondering your thoughts, because I know you're a fan of this product, um, Dr. Sinatra, what's your thoughts on Hawthorne R? Well, I'm favorable with Hawthorne because I've used it for years, um, you know, especially in my heart failure patients, uh, because again, you know, it does have some ACE-like activity. Um, and when I was using my metabolic cardiology approach, about 90 to 95% of my patients, you know, had improvement. But if I needed more improvement, I would always go to Hawthorne. Uh, I would add Hawthorne to magnesium, uh, D-ribose, CoQ10, and, and L-carnitine. And, and basically, when I added Hawthorne, um, many of my patients, uh, you know, would tell me they had a little boost. Now, if I even had to go even further, I, add, I would add taurine, sometimes taurine, you know, in, in multiple gram doses combined with Hawthorne, combined with, you know, again, my awesome foursome, uh, you know, the CoQ10, carnitine, magnesium, D-ribose. Uh, I would have to use these six ingredients. In, and now I'm talking about, you know, people with really refractory heart failure, low ejection fractions, ejection fractions in the less than 20 percent. And 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 what I would strive for is not a number, but a quality of life. In other words, if the patients could, you know, get through the night sleeping, they weren't coughing, they could walk to the bathroom. In other words, they had a decent quality of life. Uh, that's all that mattered. And, and I'll tell you, you know, being a heart specialist for decades, Congestive heart failure is a tough, tough illness uh, to live with, especially, uh, you know, when it's when it's very, very symptomatic. Great. Any additional thoughts on Hawthorne, Dr. Sheeler? No, I've had good experience with it, and I'm especially interested in the fact that it has some antiarrhythmic properties as well, because some of the things that juice the heart, you know, go the opposite direction. So to get those two benefits at the same time, I think is profoundly good. Great. So... Uh, next on the list here, uh, coleus, forscolin. Uh, forscolin is interesting because it is a botanical extract. It's not a whole plant. It's uh, derived from a leafy tropical species, typically used in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, the botanicals, names changed multiple times. Coleus barbatus, 
Coleus for Scoli, Placanthus, Barbatus. Um, when we look at the research behind it, it's a little bit interesting. There's been a lot of research that was published in the 1980s, 1990s, kind of dropped off a bit in the new millennium. I'm wondering if either of you have used uh, for scolin at all in any of your cardiovascular patients and your thoughts. I'll have a quick answer. I have not used it. You have not used it. Dr. Sheeler? I've not used it for um, cardiovascular patients. I've seen it used to affect hormones and preparations that are trying to manipulate hormone levels without actually giving the hormones. Um, but I'm interested to see the research that you provided that shows that it helps lean body mass and obesity. Those are big issues. And it's also friendly for asthma and liver fibrosis. And so I think I'm interested in learning more and using this on a preventive basis if I get a chance to look into some of those studies that are behind that and, and look for those effects. Because I really like to you know, my colleagues will go to a major cardiology center and they'll have a treadmill test and they'll say, wow, my heart was completely normal. I had a great treadmill. And I'll go, okay, that's great. I'm glad you didn't get a hypertensive response. I'm glad you didn't have STT changes, but you can have a fairly large degree of blockage, like 30 or 40 or maybe even 50% and go through a treadmill protocol and still perfuse distally and have a normal and have a normal treadmill test. And so I like to find plaque as well as vascular inflammation and cardiovascular risk factors, not only lipids, but inflammatory markers and glucose markers and, and all those kinds of things and address them early while we really have a chance to remodel the endothelium and, and maintain the architecture of the heart rather than waiting until somebody has fixed structural coronary disease. And so this to me looks promising for that. And I'd love to learn more. Great. So we were talking a little bit about this uh, before we got started and uh, nicotinamide riboside and its effects on the uh, NAD biology. It's been an interesting topic, obviously, for a while in the cellular health scene, um, anti-aging scene. So what role do you gentlemen see nicotinamide riboside playing in cardiovascular health? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll go first on this one because uh, um, I actually learned about this only a few years ago. And uh, I actually started taking, you know, derivatives, NMM, for example, which is uh, a precursor to this. And uh, I have a feeling that this is going to be a sizzling new nutraceutical in the next decade. Um, in my next uh, textbook of cardiology, it's coming out in May, 20, uh, May 2022. I, I talked about NMM and, and, and basically NAD+. In other words, these derivatives... Um, uh, certainly you know go down it's almost like you know aging for example coq10 levels plummet you know usually in a 70 year old male or, a, or an 80 year old female they really start to go down that's why you really need a supplement the same thing is true of nad plus uh, this goes down in the body and this is very very important so when you use a precursor uh like this one or nmn uh, i think it makes a lot of sense and uh and again, you know, there's two buzzwords going forward over the next 10 years. You know, people in a medical establishment are going to hear, be hearing about autography and mTOR. And, uh, you know, they're very, very confusing to really fathom. Uh, but once you get it, you'll realize that we need to use more mTOR inhibitors and, 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 and really use, you know, certain nutraceuticals that stimulate autography, meaning detoxification. And again, Eric, you're a, you're a detoxification expert as a natural path. And, and I really think, um, you know, autography is going to be a, a new vocabulary word that the natural paths will probably understand much better than the conventional medical physicians. Great. Dr. Sheeler, any additional thoughts on uh, nicotinamide riboside? Not for cardiovascular. I've used it for more neurologic and fatigue things, and sometimes the results are profound. And I'm interested to see sort of longer term data. It's like anytime you push the system and tweak it, um, is it all free? Is it all a free ride or are we paying any kind of price long term? And it's been around long enough that I don't see anything showing up. But, you know, like that happens with standard pharmaceuticals, too. It's like, hey, it looks great the first 10 or 20 years. And then you go, hmm, just look at all the things those proton pump inhibitors did we didn't know about. It's like so I always like to keep my eyes and my ears open no matter who owns it. But so far, so good. And it looks like a fascinating compound for both the brain and the heart and systemically. Great. So shifting gears now, bergamot, interesting ingredient, obviously being in the citrus family, 
patients, providers alike, probably fam familiar with other citrus family members, oranges, grapefruit, lemons, limes, but uh, bergamot in particular playing an important role to help balance lipids and cholesterol levels. Dr. Sinatra, I know you're a big fan of bergamot. What would you like to share about it and how you use it with your patients? Well, I, I like bergamot. I mean, it, it does share the same, you know, HMG co-reductase pathways. But again, it's not as powerful as a statin. And I don't think it's going to affect, you know, the CoQ10 levels because I tested a lot of CoQ10 levels on patients taking bergamot. Bergamot also has some, a blood sugar uh, favorability as well. So I think bergamot is going to be uh, used more and more often by the medical profession uh, whether they're conventional or, uh, you know, certainly um, a natural paths. And when I was talking about autography before as a detoxification, I mean, bergamot has a role here as well. So bergamot is sort of multifaceted. Um, and again, at 500 milligrams, I don't think you're going to get any side effects whatsoever. Uh, uh, people will have to use 1,000 milligrams to get probably get better cholesterol, you know, support. But at 500 milligrams, it, it could be a good metabolic therapy in the future. Great. Any additional thoughts, Dr. Sheila? No, I think it's kind and gentle. And if I, when I was just looking at numbers, it's not always as impressive as a statin. But I think with statins, um, traditional cardiologists sometimes tend to drive lipid levels too low. And you need lipids to like make membranes and to insulate nerves and to form hormones out of. And so if we can do some of that in a kinder and gentler way, especially in people like who have ApoE4, so their channels that get beta amyloid out of the brain cells and things like that aren't jammed up with LDL, but in a way that leaves enough cholesterol around for the metabolic functions it was there for, because the organism was formed with a lot of wisdom, and you don't necessarily want to say, oh, this compound is evil, whatever it is, and drive it down to zero, because it probably had a role if it's in the body. And so I like this as a kinder, gentler approach. Great. So... I think this is one of everyone's favorite topics in cardiovascular support. That's fibrinolytic enzymes, uh, natokinase being really interesting and some of the research that's been done in recent years regarding natokinase. Um, natokinase being a fermented soybean extract. Uh, Japan, it's a traditional food consumed quite regularly. Um, a lot of research on natokinase, uh, lumbrokinase, serapeptase. Wondering your thoughts on these and the research body behind them, gentlemen. Yeah, maybe I can answer this quickly. I've used all three personally. I mean, I've taken all the three myself. I've recommended them to my patients. Um, I really like them. I think one of the worst things going forward for modern contemporary man, I'm talking about, you know, 20th century man and, you know, 2022 uh, is thick blood. Red ketchup blood is a real problem uh, nowadays. You know, that's why I strongly believe in grounding because it thins the blood. And basically anything you take to thin the blood uh, is really important. Even before electromagnetics was an issue, uh, you know, as a cath cardiologist, I can tell you many times uh, I studied, I did coronary arteriography on patients with, you know, full blown heart attack with wall motion abnormalities. And when I capped them on the cap table, they had normal coronary arteries meaning that their blood clotted inside the heart. Now, if it clots inside the brain, you get a stroke. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, that, that's a disaster. If it clots inside the heart, you know, you may survive, but you may develop like, like heart failure or a wall motion abnormality and something like that. So as a young cardiologist doing, you know, multiple cardiac catheterizations, I saw this and it really bothered me. It really bothered me, you know, seeing young people, especially people in their thirties, forties and fifties with, normal coronaries who had major heart attacks. And again, I got attracted to these types of enzymes because red ketchup blood is going to be an enigma going forward, especially, uh, you know, with all the toxins in the environment, the heavy blood sugar that we take in on a daily basis, uh, the electromagnetics, the insecticides, the pesticides, all this stuff will thicken the blood. And we need to use agents, you know, whether they're, you know, fibrinolytic enzymes with things like earthing and grounding to thin the blood, because thinning the blood going forward is gonna be something very important in cardiovascular prevention in the future. Great, any additional thoughts, Dr. Sheeler? Yeah, this is like one of my favorite categories as well. I'm especially familiar with natokinase, especially when combined with pycnogenol. There's data that people taking a, a product of this, there was a small study that showed that people who took this before they flew to Europe, they had no blood clots compared to about 4% of asymptomatic blood clots in other, in other people. And so I've used this 
when I need something just short of a full-blown, you know, um, novel anticoagulant and had really good luck with it. I use it in a lot of my cardiovascular programs, lowers blood pressure, helps lipids, but it also sort of nibbles away at a safe, in a safe fashion at some of those other things. Lumbokinase is stronger. And then I've used serapeptase, but I also think that it, it seems to have some biofilm disruptor product uh, properties, which is good when you're trying to treat some GI things. On the other hand, biofilms are also there for a reason. And so I don't have as much experience with that one. So I'm a little more cautious with that than the other two. You know, Dr. Sheila, I'm glad you mentioned the biofilm because about 12 to 13 years ago, I had a hip replacement. Uh, and um, unknowingly, uh, I ended up seeing a plastic surgeon because I had some, you know, some skin cancers on my face. And he ended up cutting me, you know, and injecting and, uh, you know, doing cauterization on my face and stuff like that. But I forgot to tell him I had a, a hip replacement. And sure enough, I was uh, I came down to Florida and about two to three weeks after, um, you know, I had these, you know, the surgical procedures on my face. I looked like a boxer. I had band-aids all over the place and stuff like that. I had pain in my right hip. And intuitively, I said, oh, no, I hope I don't have a staph infection because I have a prosthetic right hip. So I'm at a medical conference. Um, actually, Dr. Lee Cowden was giving a conference in Florida. It was one of the lectures. And I, I went down to the uh, showroom and I asked if anybody had any serapeptase. And sure enough, a woman heard me and I ended up writing a book with this guy because uh, I, I wrote Health Revelations from Heaven and Earth. That's the way I, I, I met this couple. She had serapeptase in a pocketbook and I took it immediately because I wanted I had in my mind the magical word you said, biofilms, because this is where serapeptase is. All I was thinking about was, geez, could I have a staph infection for my face, <laughs> go into that prosthetic hip, develop in biofilms. So I, I wanted to dissolve them. And I was taking uh, serapeptase for two to three weeks, and I, I had a happy ending. So anecdotal That's report, great. but I used it on myself, and I loved it. That's great. That's One cool. of the questions we had coming in, I'm just looking at some of them now since we're getting at the end, but was uh, concerns about using uh, fibrinolytic enzymes in coordination with blood thinning medications or things like aspirin or any other blood thinners. Your thoughts with that? I worry about that. I mean, look, I mean, uh, I'm a heart specialist. I've seen a lot of people bleed from aspirin. I've seen a lot of people bleed from Coumadin. I've had deaths from aspirin and Coumadin. So again, um, when you use these nutraceuticals, I don't like to use them with heavy pharmaceutical drugs at the same time. I worry about a synergistic response. And then, you know, people could be taking some unknowingly taking some St. John's ward or some other medication that it could, could affect the clotting system or some other situation that you're unaware of. And all of a sudden you have the perfect storm and then you got a massive bleed on your hand. So I tend to be more conservative in this area and I give people a no on that situation. Great. I'll, I'll also want to add here, too, that uh, both of you gentlemen have done some really impressive um, protocols for us on Wellevate. And those are available in the Wellevate expert uh, section of the protocol library. Uh, there's a nice uh, cardiovascular foundations by Dr. Sheeler and a blood pressure support by Dr. Sinatra. So we'd really like to, uh, if you'd like to check those out, check out uh, Wellevate uh, for that. Okay, that was a great presentation. And it's nice to see a lot of the questions in the chat and in the Q&A. Thank you for submitting those. That was a pre-recorded session. So we obviously can't answer those questions. However, we have, when you registered for the webinar, we have your email address. So we will forward those questions on. And if we can get an answer, we will uh, send that along to you. It's nice to see a lot of familiar names in the chat. Um, and yes, it did end abruptly as well, for my opinion. Maybe they accidentally stopped the recording. Um, I see some of our fellows. And so uh, as Andrea is preparing to share screen and get the slides back up and running, um, I just will start talking because I know what happens to be on those slides. Uh, we have our AIHM annual conference, which is called People, Planet, and Purpose, is going to be in October this year. It's going to be in-person again. We are returning to in-person conferences 
and it's um, going to be in San Diego, California. So we hope that you will join us there. Let's see if I can get the slides going. Oh, and as soon as I say that, <laughs> she's got them up. Thanks, Andrea. So yeah, so here are the dates, October 28th to 30th, 2022. And we're gonna be returning to Paradise Point, which if you've been a member or a conference attendee in the past, that was our location several years ago for several years. So we're looking forward to seeing many of you there. And as I had mentioned in the beginning, AIHM is a global organization and we just want to put the intention out there to imagine the change we can make as a unified global community. We have individual members, organizational members. We have fellows and members in almost every state in various countries around the world. And we wanna just keep growing that. So share information about AIHM with folks you know. So as I mentioned earlier, I am the director of admissions for the fellowship, and we want to invite you to an upcoming open house if you are interested in learning more about the fellowship. On Thursday, March 10th, I will be joined by Mary Purdy. She's awesome. She just redid and updated the nutrition content in our fellowship curriculum, and she's going to be joining me, and we'll tell you about some of the latest updates and what we have happening and she's going to talk a little bit about what it's like teaching for the fellowship and working with our fellows. Next slide. If you're interested in joining us for the open house on Thursday, March 10th, please go to AIHM.org forward slash fellowship, scroll down and register. So one of the questions or several people asked about the slides being sent out. To my knowledge, they are not. However, I just want to remind everyone, and I did put this in the chat, that we do have a YouTube channel and this presentation and all of our other wellness webinars are posted there. It will take us a couple of days, maybe by next Monday or Tuesday, we will uh, get this recording up onto the YouTube channel. So just be on the lookout for that. You can see the link there, youtube.com forward slash AIHM global as well as the Twitter handle, Facebook, all of the different social media that AIHM has. So please be sure to check those out. And if you're not already, like, follow, and subscribe. We also invite you, if you're not an AIHM member, to please consider joining our organization. Or if your membership has laughed, lapsed, to please renew and get involved in local chapters. They're all in different areas throughout the country and world and involved in the Student Alliance if that fits where you are in your professional career. Again, on behalf of Emerson Ecologics, Wellevate and AIHM, we thank you for joining us today and we hope you um, enjoyed this presentation.